The Center for Audit Quality presents Profession in Focus. Hello and welcome to this edition of Profession in Focus. I'm Cindy Fernelli, the Executive Director of the Center for Audit Quality, and I'm very pleased today to have as our guest Sarah Matthew. Sarah, welcome. Sarah is, among other things, uh, on the board of Zurich Insurance Company, Freddie Mac, and Shire, and she also chairs the audit committee of Campbell Soup and has for a few years now. Right. And then also, you are a former CFO and CEO of Dun & Bradstreet, so you really bring a breadth of experience and knowledge to your role, so we're very anxious to explore some of that. So let me stop with, start with the work of audit committees. That's, of course, something very important to the Center for Audit mm -hmm. Quality and your oversight role of the financial reporting process. But I want to start first by your experience as a CFO, and you're also in bringing your audit committee work at Campbell Soup. So what advice do you give to a new audit committee member on overseeing the financial reporting process, working with the CFO, working with the external auditor? Sure, uh, that's a great question. So beyond what I would say is fairly obvious, which is you need to know the line between management and the board, which applies to everybody, not just audit committee members. I would separate those qualities into two bits. I talk about table stakes and then everything else. Uh, now when I talk about table stakes, you have to be a financial expert. And I think people who are best equipped to do this are people who have been CFOs. It's not just oversight or having managed a CFO, it's actually having been in that seat and having to make the myriad judgments, all the different things that get thrown your way. Uh, so I think it's important to be a financial expert. Second, I also believe it's equally important to be curious and committed to continue to learn and grow in your field. You don't need to have every FASB interpretation under your belt, but you need to understand what's going on and you need to understand how this could impact your company going forward. And then uh, finally, you have to be courageous and you have to be independent. Uh, that becomes so very important. And these are table stakes. Now beyond that, I think there are two other factors that are important. You have to connect the dots. And by connecting the dots, it is about understanding that those things that show up in your financials are just symptomatic of perhaps a broader issue and you want to be able to address that, and that's often a board issue. So I'll give you a couple of examples. You take an impairment charge. Uh, well, that's just an accounting charge. I remember one time a director telling me, but that's just an accounting issue. No, it's much more than that. It means that an acquisition is actually not performing to objectives, and you have to understand why. That's a board issue, it's a strategic issue. Why is that happening? Is it because management is not equipped to integrate acquisitions? It, was it a change in assumptions, or was it just something else? I think that's important to know. Other examples could be, I mean, I've seen times when management action plans stay open for years. Uh, that's unacceptable, and it could be symptomatic of a broader issue. Is it a tone at the top issue? Is it a cultural issue? So that connecting of the dots, I believe, is really, really important. And last, you have to be an honest consigliere and somebody that the CFO and the head of audit can trust. So they come to you, they come to you with their problems, and they trust that it's a safe place where they can come. And I think that role is just so important as an audit committee chair because we rely so much. They are the boots on the ground, they are the feet that actually let us know what's going on in the company. So that's probably about five things very loosely defined that I think are important. Well, those are great. that's great advice for not just a new audit committee member, but for any audit committee yeah. member. I know that one of your leadership mantras is communication, communication, communication or communicate, communicate, communicate. So talk to us a little bit tactically. How do you facilitate that between the board and shareholders, board and management, board and your outside advisors, such as your independent auditor? Sure, uh, communication is a skill that I think we never talk about enough. And as a board member, as an audit committee, or even as a professional, you have to focus on communication. Um, and the advice I give people over time is watch the way you speak, you know, lots of ums, etc. Really take away from the message you're trying to get across. If you're an audit committee member, I often say, or even if you're a board member, I think of yourself as being least among equals. So your job is to influence. You influence by communicating. So that's why I think communication is so important. 
And foundational to great communication is the ability to listen. To listen, to seek, to understand. Not to listen, to solve and push your solution, but really to seek, to understand what the other person is trying to say. And as a board member, you are the least among equals. Everybody, what everyone has to say around the table is important. Now, regarding communication with shareholders, as a former chair CEO, I believe that is best in the hands of the existing CEO and CFO. They are the closest involved. But there are times when I think the board has to get involved. And I sit on the board of Shire, which is a FTSE listed uh, company, and that is one where there are planned communications between the head of compensation and the shareholders. It's called a consultation process where they talk about you know, what the company plans to do and how much you should pay the CEO. That's not a US practice, that's a UK practice. There are also times when investors are dissatisfied with the company's performance, and at that point in time, someone on the board has to step in. In all of this, communication is important because you have to get alignment as a board before you communicate. Otherwise, you could be off message and there could be unintended consequences and you would never want that to happen. Between board and management, foundational is trust. I believe communications are open when there is an environment of trust and creating that environment is really important. And when you have a trusted environment, you're able to communicate about difficult issues in a very open and very constructive manner because, we, in manner because we're all trying to do the same thing, which is to move the business forward. And more good advice. So uh, I can see why you're such a successful board I member. Would not, I would not say that. Um, you know, like I said, least among equals. <laughs> <laughs> so as you think about the various board responsibilities and all the work that goes on to a board member's plate and an audit committee member's plate in particular, what are the issues that keep you up at night? You know, that's a great question. It's hard to generalize because it is so specific to a particular company. And we can use a couple of frameworks and then try and broaden the team. So a couple of frameworks. Uh, when you're running a company, I always thought there were four things that were really important. Strategy and execution. There is no bright line between strategy and execution. So a strategy that cannot be executed is worthless. Executing without strategic clarity is dangerous. But beyond that, I would say talent, culture, and the last, the CEO's will to lead, all of those come into play. And so it's hard to tell where the issue is, but that may be a framework to frame the issues. Another way to think of it is to step back and think broadly about changes that are having massive impacts across all industries. And when I think of that, I think of technology. And technology, I believe, is disrupting just about every business. For the longest time, we thought of technology in a very contained box. We knew software is eating hardware. But today, I think technology is impacting every industry, and nobody is immune. And I still remember approximately 10 years ago, and that wasn't that long ago, I guess the iPhone is only 10 years old, but 10 years ago, McKinsey put out a great study about the 10 technological trends that will profoundly impact your life. And let me see if I remember them. It was local, social, crowd, cloud, big data, robotics, genomics, autonomous vehicles, and the Internet of Things. Now, I would say that is one place to start and to think about how those devices are going to impact your business. And on one of the boards that I sit on, they took us out west um, to spend a week just on what you would call tech immersion. We spent a day at Google, a day at Amazon, a day at Tesla, and on and on. That's fascinating. It was, it was an unbelievable exercise. And so when I think of technology, it's not just bits and bytes. I think of technology very, very broadly. I talked about those 10 trends. Which they were very prescient, weren't well, they? Well, it was I didn't come up with it. It was McKinsey. It's a great study, oh. 10 years old. And I would encourage you they pretty you to, much nailed it, didn't they, they? I think they nailed it. I remember listening to Elon Musk, I think it was about 10 years ago, and he talked about his vision, and I thought, yeah, right. For me, that was an eye roll. Well, less than 10 years, I'm now in his car, his vision. And I believe that's what it takes. So does that keep me up at night? No, it actually makes me feel excited about the future and does the possibilities. Does the cybersecurity aspects of it keep you up at you night? You have to worry about cybersecurity, and for a whole host of reasons. The crooks are getting smarter, and the languages are more lax and not written with the kinds of protocols that existed 
many, many years ago. That is to allow end-user computing to move at warp speed. So we bring our devices from home. We like Twitter. We like this. We like that. We click on links we should never click. We, and, you know, this, these are real issues. And so managing end-user computing, as well about a broad framework, and I believe you guys have a great framework to think about cybersecurity. Cyber uh, there's lots of great stuff that you can actually leverage. And I wish I could tell you I had that silver bullet for cybersecurity. I don't. I don't think anybody does. And it's... when you think you do, it, that boundary is going to move out yet again. Mm -hmm. So you're going to constantly be chasing after this. And that is one of the issues that come out from this brave new world we're headed towards. So yes, a lot to look forward to uh, as we're in this really innovative, transformative yeah. time. I think yeah. it's exciting to be absolutely uh, in the marketplace and watching and experience this, even absolutely. though it is sometimes discomforting. So I want to, before we close, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about diversity. Uh, we all have seen studies and know that having a diverse board, not just diversity of experience and knowledge and expertise, but also personal diversity, whether it's gender or age or ethnicity, is so important to the performance of a company. Mm -hmm. And yet we in the United States are a little behind the rest of the world or much of the world in having diverse boards. Why do you think that is and what can we all do to maybe uh, quicken the pace of getting diversity on boards? Oh, that's a great question. If I had the answer, I believe we could have solved it. And I think it's complicated because at the end of the day, human beings make these decisions. But beyond that, I believe you have filters through which you see the world. You have filters, I have filters. And when you're human, those filters actually help reinforce what you already believe. And to address that issue as an individual, you need to be able to name your filters. I often try and write them down, my biases, my filters through which I see the world. And when you do that, you at least are aware of it, and it makes, it makes you 10% better at addressing what are filters. Uh, people say that your brain in a nanosecond converts words into visuals into a judgment. So this is the issue. So if you want to have a divorce board, and to be quite candid, the numbers are so disappointing, you are going to have to make sure that the individuals making those decisions make a conscious decision uh, to essentially have the appropriate levels of inclusion. Europe is already there. Uh, I don't know if the US were there because you set off another set of unconscious biases. Oh, that's the token woman, that's the token minority. And you would never want that to be the case. Uh, diversity, I believe, is also not just uh, about race, and ethnicity, and um, sexual orientation, etc. It is also about diversity of thought. Uh, as board members, you have to understand that the person with that contrarian point of view may be the one you have to listen to. And again, your biases get in the way of that. I don't have a great answer. Uh, I do believe trying to name your own filters and your own biases is a good mm -hmm. step to make you a better leader, a better person. And beyond that, um, making a conscious effort to have a diverse slate when you look at a potential candidate. So when I look at all the board specs, one of the issues are we all have these detailed specs based on a set of characteristics, but the answer always seems to be the same. You want a current CEO or a just retired CEO a current CFO or a just retired CFO. Well, look at the numbers there, they're not great. So the pool is narrow. But if you're looking for a particular position, interview at least 50% women and the appropriate percentage of minorities. And do not look at any candidate until the slate is diverse enough. And companies that have done that, I believe, have done a really good job. When I think of Freddie Mac, one of the boards I'm on, we have a pretty diverse board an incredibly well-functioning and capable board. So I believe it can be done. Campbell Soup is also one that is above the norms. Could they both get better? Yes. Uh, but at least we've made you know, good progress in the right direction and above the norm as opposed to being below it. If you're below the norm, take a hard look at it and commit to fix it. I think if you commit to fix something, you will fix it. Well, it sounds as though you at Campbell Soup and at Freddie Mac consciously made the decision as a board, let's try to get That's more right. diverse candidates in That's so right. that we increase our success of Absolutely. getting a diverse board. So Absolutely. it's going to take that conscious decision. I think so. Well, Sarah, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. 
and I want to thank all of you for joining this edition of Profession in Focus. Music